Greetings, it's the Digital Dog once again, and I have a new video tutorial, part two of a recent video I did on some urban legends about sRGB. This is what I'm going to cover today. Some specific uh, misinformation that I gathered directly from the internet. If you care what other people see, you'll have better control if you edit photos start to finish in sRGB. Most images are in sRGB color space. Uh, a misstatement about how sRGB is smaller than CMYK, but basically that uh, if you're printing professionally, you don't ever have to go beyond sRGB because CMYK is a smaller color space than sRGB. We'll look at that. And if you work with anything but sRGB, you're just going to have problems. It's just too hard for you to, uh, to work with other color spaces. So let's take a look at some of these particular mistruths. The first one is the idea that you should use sRGB start to finish. Now, I did a video called The Benefits of uh, Printing in Wide Gamut Data. It's uh, up on my webpage and on YouTube. And I think if you view that video and go through the testing procedures using the file that I provided, you'll see that uh, sRGB is absolutely suboptimal for output to a printed uh, device. Depending on the color gamut of the device, the suboptimal results may be very significant. So the best thing for you to do is to view that video, download the file, and uh, do your own testing. sRGB is really ideal for one output use today, and that's output to the internet, the web, and mobile devices. Using sRGB does not guarantee that what you see and what other people see will match. You need color management for that to happen. Um, many web browsers and many applications are not color managed, and therefore sRGB is the best answer today simply because many of the devices we're working with um, mimic sRGB. If you're working with a color managed application, it really doesn't matter what RGB working space you're working with. They'll all preview correctly. Here are two links that you might want to copy or pause the video and, uh, and, and take down that will allow you to check whether or not your web browser is color managed. The first link is a very a quick and easy way to see if your web browser is color managed. The second one um, goes into a lot of detail about how to configure certain web browsers for color management. It's much more thorough. Uh, I recommend both, but if you want a quick and dirty test, go to the first URL seen above. So sRGB doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a visual match when you post your images to the web and mobile devices, unless you're using color management. For RGB values, a set of RGB triplets, a set of numbers to preview even close to identically, we need color management. That's its goal. Um, so while sRGB is optimal today for people who are posting images to the internet where many, many people are not viewing those images on a color managed browser, what that means is that while the sRGB image in a non-color managed browser probably will not look poor, it doesn't mean it's going to match what you see when you're viewing those sRGB numbers in a color managed application. The reason we post sRGB to the internet and to mobile devices today is that most display systems, when they are not working in a color managed fashion, uh, will produce a reasonably looking uh, image from sRGB. That's because most of these devices are roughly sRGB like. I'll show you in an upcoming slide what happens when you work with a display that isn't like sRGB and it assumes sRGB. This all falls apart. For example, on a wide gamut display without color management, sRGB looks really awful. I'll show you what that looks like. So sRGB is a specification from the past century. It was based on a CRT display with a specific set of color phosphors. Not many of the devices like that are in use today. Modern LCD displays try to mimic sRGB and they do a pretty good job depending on which uh, uh, LCD display you're using. But again, the internet and mobile devices without color management is the Wild West. Basically, uh, 
anything is possible. We don't know if the people viewing these images are using a color managed browser. We don't know if they've calibrated and profiled their displays. We don't know how the displays are calibrated and profiled. So sRGB doesn't guarantee a match. It just guarantees that if you use sRGB versus Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB or any other RGB working space, sRGB will look the least worst on such devices. Okay, so let's take a quick look at what a wide gamut display brings to the party when you're not using color management. Um, on the left, I'm uh, using a color managed browser that I can turn color management on and off, which is Firefox. So on the left, we see Firefox with color management uh, off, and we're viewing Adobe RGB on a wide gamut display. And as you can see, it looks pretty good. It looks decent. Whereas on the right, with color management off, I'm viewing sRGB. So again, I'm not color managing the data. I'm, I'm viewing it on a wide gamut color managed display, a uh, NEC PA272W. Um, I'm viewing sRGB on a wide gamut display without color management, and it looks oversaturated. Um, a lot of people will tell you that if you don't post sRGB to the internet, the images look dull. If you post Adobe RGB to the internet, the images look dull. Well, that's true if you're working with a non-color managed browser. sRGB will look better than Adobe RGB on a non-color managed browser on an sRGB-like display. The opposite is true when we look at sRGB on a wide gamut display. It looks oversaturated. So the bottom line is that we really need color management in our browsers to view the numbers correctly. So what you're going to see here is I'm going to toggle back and forth between sRGB and Adobe RGB on this wide gamut display without color management. You'll see how the sRGB data looks oversaturated when viewed on a wide gamut display. So again, sRGB doesn't guarantee a match. The displays with an sRGB gamut don't mean they produce sRGB necessarily. There's a lot of attributes that can alter the display's behavior so that it's a mile off from sRGB. For example, the on-screen displays that many people will play with will uh, alter the color appearance of their displays and alter them from what could or should be sRGB. It'll also ensure that uh, what you see and what they see may not match. sRGB has specifications for the ambient light conditions surrounding the display. So if your display isn't in such a condition, it's possible that you may see something slightly different than someone else who's got an ambient condition that's vastly different. And again, without color management in the browser, the RGB values that I see and the RGB values that you see are going to look different. The other misinformation that we hear all the time is that most images are in sRGB. Well, many images may end up in sRGB for the web, and they should, but where do they begin? Now, if your camera, your digital camera or your scanner is set to give you sRGB, then that's what you're going to get, sRGB. But if you're capturing raw data, then you have the option of having a color gamut of an image that greatly exceeds sRGB. It may not be anything like sRGB. The question that I've asked often of people who propose an sRGB workflow is, why clip the colors you can capture and you can output? You can always produce sRGB from wider gamut data. So the recommended workflow would be to work from raw data, and render that raw data in the widest gamut, highest bit depth you can, the highest resolution, obviously. And then when the time comes that you need to post an image to the web or to a mobile device, you'd resample the size down to an appropriate resolution, uh, appropriate number of pixels. Uh, you'd convert to sRGB, and you'd post that to the web and mobile devices. That leaves the rendered master archive in its highest, widest gamut, highest bit depth, highest resolution for other uses like printing. Here's another uh, piece of information or misinformation we hear all the time. Uh, you don't really need to go beyond sRGBs for professional print work. It's not true. And if you, again, view the video on wide gamut uh, working spaces going out to print and test using that test file that I've provided for you, you'll see that that's absolutely not the case.
The color gamut of sRGB is often smaller than CMYK. Fact of the matter is, sRGB will often have a much smaller color gamut in the green cyan area of its color space. So for example, what you're seeing here, this triangular shape is sRGB. The uh, strange shaped color space you see is uh, swap V2, output color space for uh, commercial printers. And what you can see is that the cyans and the greens fall outside sRGB. Yes, overall sRGB appears to be larger, but what's important here is that if you use sRGB instead of, say, Adobe RGB, all those colors that fall outside that triangular shape will clip. So you can actually output those colors even to a four-color press or using a swap system. This illustrates that, indeed, sRGB is too small in its color gamut to contain all the colors that you could reproduce here. Certainly, modern inkjet printers, and even some of the older devices whose color gamut aren't known to be significantly large, like those that image into silver paper, we can see that the color gamut of sRGB is too small and that colors do fall outside the color gamut. And you're seeing that in this 3D um, plot. Over on the left, you're seeing three uh, very common types of silver printers, a light jet, a Naritsu, and a Frontier. And again, that red blob is sRGB. All the colors that fall outside that blob are colors that would clip if you used sRGB. In other words, all of these printers have a color gamut that exceed sRGB somewhere in color space. If you use sRGB, you can't print those colors. So the future in sRGB, the fact of the matter is that uh, Wide gamut displays both for desktop and mobile devices are moving into a wide gamut uh, behavior. They've been around for a while. Certainly desktop wide gamut displays have been around for a while at a price, but the prices are coming down all the time. If you look at, for example, the new iPad Pro, it actually has two color spaces available, and one of them is actually a slightly larger than Adobe RGB 1998. So we're seeing mobile devices now moving into wider gamut color spaces for display. So that gives us a sign of what's possibly coming. Eventually, sRGB will be the wrong answer as more and more devices uh, become wide gamut, even if they are not color managed. Now, hopefully, again, browsers and, and applications that need to view color images will become color managed across the board, in which case we could use sRGB or a wider gamut color space. But uh, what you're going to see is as more devices become wider gamut, and if they are represented on uh, applications that are not color managed, the answer will be to use a wider gamut color space like Adobe RGB instead of sRGB, as I illustrated uh, in a few slides back. If you were to use sRGB in a non-color managed fashion on a wide gamut display, it's going to look too saturated. It will not look acceptable. A few other issues. A lot of people will tell you that you should you always use sRGB because outside labs always demand files in sRGB. Why do they do this? It's not necessarily for you to get the best print. It's for them to speed up their workflow. They want all the images in a standardized color space so that they can just send them through their front ends and not have to worry about doing further conversions. Some of these labs will provide you with an ICC output profile for soft proofing, and yet they demand sRGB. This is a suboptimal workflow, and it's really not a true color managed workflow. Uh, they want you to believe they're color managed by giving you this profile and asking you to soft proof, but you're not allowed to convert to the color space using that profile. And this raises a couple of questions. Is the profile actually being used for the final conversions? Uh, how long ago was that profile built? Does it actually reflect the conditions of uh, the device they say it should? What rendering intent are they going to use? Uh, when you convert images uh, to an output color space, it's useful to soft proof and toggle between the relative color metric intent, the perceptual rendering intent, and perhaps even the saturation rendering intent and pick the one that you think looks best based on the image content. If you have a lab that demands sRGB, right off the bat, you're working with a color space that's too small for their output devices we've seen. Second, you have no control over the rendering intent. They're going to force the conversion for all of your images into one rendering intent. 
We don't know if black point compensation is being used. We don't know if the profile actually reflects the condition of the printer. So these are some of the reasons why the just send us sRGB, but here's a profile for soft proofing doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So here's the bottom line. sRGB today is ideal for images intended for the web and mobile devices. But it doesn't ensure that once you post those images, what you saw on your system and what other users see will visually match. They should be relatively close. Of course, you know the old saying about close. It only counts in hand grenades and horseshoes. sRGB is suboptimal for all other output needs going out to print. Again, you can prove this to yourself by running your own tests using the files that I've uploaded in my video on uh, the benefits of a wide gamut color space on output. If you're capturing raw data, the just use sRGB workflow is going to ensure you're going to clip colors that you could capture and you can reproduce. I don't see the benefit of doing that. You can have a wide gamut capture in a high res, uh, in wide bit, and you can convert that data to sRGB um, if you use the sRGB only workflow, you can't go the other way. Working with a wide gamut, high bit, high resolution data from RAW going out to sRGB for its one intended use makes a lot more sense. It has a lot more flexibility than just use sRGB from beginning to end. So the bottom line, I think, is that people who care about the quality of their image color and output uh, can take the time to understand color management and working spaces. It's not too difficult. None of us are born with an intimate knowledge of color management or photography or anything else. We all have to strive to understand these uh, processes uh, and it's well worth the task to do so. That's about it. That's what I have for you for today. Um, hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you very much.